The U.S. imposes tariffs. China responds in kind. But is the growing trade war a sign that something deeper and more unsettling is happening to the global system of rules and institutions? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Adrian Finnegan. Last week it was Europe, this week China. Step by step, US President Donald Trump's tariffs on steel and aluminium are taking effect. And countries around the world are responding. But the issue isn't just about trade. President Trump talks about winning and what he calls better deals. But it often seems like his real target is the web of international institutions and alliances that have evolved in the decades since the end of the Second World War, often at the behest of America itself. We have much to discuss with our guests today. But first, Kimberly Halkett reports from Washington. He already stands accused of implementing trade policies that may in the end harm the United States and its allies. But President Donald Trump is threatening even more. We're not planning anything now, but if they don't treat us properly, uh, we will be doing something. Thank you. The everybody. United States made the first move in this trade dispute, imposing tariffs on foreign steel and aluminum imports. Now it's also considering doing the same when it comes to foreign made vehicles and auto part imports. This, despite warnings, it could hurt America's car industry and lead to countermeasures by top trading partners. On Wednesday, German Chancellor Angela Merkel sounded the alarm on a looming trade war. We have tariffs on aluminum and steel. It appears cars, too, will be imposed with tariffs when they're imported into the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, this has the character of a trade conflict. But the trade conflict isn't limited to America's European allies. After the United States announced it would implement tariffs on up to 34 billion of Chinese imports, China is also taking action to protect its own interests. As long as the United States issues a so-called tariff list, China will take necessary measures to firmly protect its legitimate interests. U.S. trading partners, including the European Union, China and Japan, have voiced their concern at the World Trade Organization. There's fear of a potential collapse of the rules-based global trading system. In general, people want trade to be under a set of rules so that there's certainty and predictability. And what Trump has done is totally undermine that system. So. It's not just what he's actually put in place, it's what he's threatened to do and what that does to trust. That trust faces further erosion. Trump has long made clear his dislike of the WTO, which governs the rules of international trade. Now a leaked draft suggests the U.S. president wants to pull out of the WTO, effectively upending the global trading order that's been in place for more than half a century. Kimberly Helkett, Al Jazeera, Washington. Well, let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. Joining us from Birmingham in the UK is Scott Lucas, Professor of International Politics at the University of Birmingham. From London, we're joined by Philip Lagrain, former economic advisor to the President of the European Commission. And via Skype from Hong Kong is Pauline Leung, Managing Director of Asia Analytica. Welcome to you all. Uh, Scott, let's start with you. Uh, can a trade war, I don't want to get too bogged down in, in trade and tariffs, but nonetheless, that's where we'll start. Um, can a trade war between the U.S. and China be won? Will one side come out of this victorious over the other? No. No one wins in a trade war. Let's just get that you know, set out from the very start of this discussion. One side may suffer less. Its trade and investment may be affected less. Its jobs may be affected less. In this case, probably China. But the whole point about international trade is not that it's a win-lose. The whole point is is that each side benefits by building upon its strengths. Now, that is what the trade of uh, the Trump administration is challenging. The idea that Donald Trump has isn't that you have a cooperative relationship where both sides win in trade. It is that one side wins, in this case, the U.S., because the other side is ripping America off. It's as simple as that. And more importantly, he has key advisors, people like Peter Navarro, Stephen Miller, Wilbur Ross, who support that vision. Now, 
in the long run, America will lose jobs. America will lose investment. America will lose international standing that further erodes its economic power. But the gamble that the Trump administration is, is that somehow they can get a short-term political benefit, if not necessarily economic one, that shows that, quote, they are tough and the rest of the world has to bow down to American wishes. Scott, you say he has all these people around him who, who share his, his view. Are they right? Is America being ripped off by the rest of the world? Well, I'm sure that your other guests will be able to explain this in detail, but frankly, no. Uh, there are other, there are always points of trade disputes between countries. So, for example, we might talk that the United States has an issue with China supposedly seizing intellectual property or that China has manipulated the currency market. But in general, the United States has benefited from trade with China. It's benefited from trade with Asia, has done so over the decades since the Asian economic machine was rebuilt after World War II. So when you talk about, in general, the protectionist approach to the American economy does not lead to economic benefit. It might protect some jobs, but it will lose far more jobs in the medium to the long term. It might protect some small portion of the American industrial base, but a larger part of the American industrial base whether it's automotive, whether it's steel, whether it's services, that base will be eroded and that base will suffer losses, if not sooner, than at some point during the Trump administration's first term. All right, let's see what, what Philip Legrain has to say, former economic advisor to the president of the European Commission. Uh, Philip, Trump has said the tariffs uh, on China are aimed at stopping the unfair transfers of American technology and intellectual property to China and about protecting jobs. Given what you've, you've just heard there, is Trump going to protect U.S. jobs by, by starting a trade war with China? No, of course he's not. Uh, he may uh, protect a few jobs in a few protected industries, but overall uh, protectionism is going to cost more American jobs than it creates. And you can see that already with um, uh, the steel tariffs which have been imposed. Hardly any Americans work in steel production and millions and millions work in industries uh, that use steel. And of course, everyone loses out uh, from paying uh, more, not just for steel, but for every product that contains uh, steel. I think what's really striking about this, and, and your, early, your report at the start alluded to it, this is actually much, much bigger than just uh, a trade war, of which there have been others in the past. Uh, now, Donald Trump seems intent on blowing up the international trading system and indeed the broader international uh, uh, order. Uh, and you know, uh, the United States uh, has gone from being an enlightened hegemon underpinning the rules that provide stability and predictability uh, to others uh, to a, a rogue state uh, that is set at blowing up the system. And I think it's a very, very worrying moment. And the repercussions are much broader than just simply uh, the, the narrow economic ones of immediate economic loss. Pauline, do you, do you agree with that? Pauline Lug in, in, in Hong Kong, is the U.S. now a, a rogue state? What are the implications of, of, of the U.S. Uh, withdrawing from WTO rules and norms, for example? I think there has been far too much focus just on the dollars and cents, the trade aspect. I think there's now growing American perceptions of China, not just as a rules-bending competitor in trade and commerce, but as an all-round threat. And that is what I believe is underpinning the, the fight and the quarrel that China is now an all-round threat in not just in trade and business, but in political domination, in military aspects, in technology, suddenly there's the perception of China being a real huge threat. So it's more than just trade. It's it's this fear, this this dawn of an, an ice age in relations, if you like, with China that I think will continue. So for the Trump administration, Pauline, this is about, as far as you're concerned, containing a rising China. Yes, it is. And remember that the this has the support, bilateral support in Congress, in one of the recent bills about Chinese investment in the United States. It was passed 400 to two. I mean, that's that's you know, you know, bipartisan support. So it is a perception of China as a threat. 
this is more than just dollars and cents who gets you know to to win more in this trade or that trade or who gets to import and export more this is a much broader conflict scott lucas is the us a rogue state is it trying to destroy the global system of rules and institutions and if so why i don't think the us is a rogue state because i think american economic institutions Many American political institutions want to maintain international order, but Donald Trump and his inner circle are rogues. They are the ones who have a particular vision, which is that there is no need for international cooperation, indeed that international cooperation is a threat. And let me explain that by going beyond what Pauline just said. I agree with her that key Trump advisors see the fight with China as being foremost. Uh, that includes former advisors like Steve Bannon, the White House chief of staff. But two things. One is, is that Donald Trump can hold that idea of China as a threat while quite liking the Chinese leader Xi Jinping because he admires Xi's strength. And secondly, this war, and it is a trade war, was not just with China. It is with the European Union. Trump doesn't believe there should be a European Union. It is with Canada and Mexico. Trump doesn't believe there should be a North American free trade area. It is with the Pacific, no Trans-Pacific partnership. In other words, the United States is not America first here. It is Trump's America alone against everyone else. And that is a rogue approach that can cause nothing but harm to America and to other countries as well. So what are the implications, Scott, of all of this for, for other institutions that came into being at the end of the Second World War? Bretton Woods institutions, NATO. This is the greatest crisis since 1945. Let's just say this point blank. It's greater than the crises we faced over the duration of the Cold War. It is certainly greater than the post-Cold War challenges that we faced because every institution, political, economic, social, is under threat. You refer to NATO, for example. In a few days' time, Donald Trump will go to the NATO summit. Having said that NATO is obsolete, having said privately a couple of weeks ago to European leaders, that he thinks NATO should go the way of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. They should be dismissed. And that within a couple days after that, he replaces that international meeting, that challenge to NATO, with what Donald Trump really admires, which is a one-on-one -on summit, one -on -one summit with Vladimir Putin of Russia. In other words, for Trump and his advisors, you really are talking about the idea that there are authoritarian elites that lead countries. And that's where power resides. They can live with Putin's Russia. They can live with Kim's North Korea. They can live with Erdogan's Turkey because they can work with them individually rather than having these messy international institutions that are supposedly ripping America off. Philip Lagrain, how do you respond to that? Is this the greatest crisis uh, since 1945? What's to be done? I think it is the biggest challenge to uh, the liberal order since its creation in the years uh, after the Second World War. Um, you know, there have been previous spats uh, over defence issues, for example, over Iraq. There have been previous trade disputes. There's never been a US president who has utter disdain uh, for his allies uh, in the European Union and in NATO um, more generally. Uh, there's never been a US president uh, that has set out to destroy uh, the international institutions that America uh, created. Uh, and there's never been uh, a US president uh, who has uh, declared trade war uh, on uh, all and sundry uh, at the same time. Uh, and I think it's uh, a very worrying moment indeed. Now, from a European perspective, uh, this could go one of two ways. Uh, one, uh, Trump might succeed uh, in his aim of uh, causing the disintegration of the European Union. And certainly he has allies uh, within the EU uh, who have a similar agenda. For example, uh, the Matteo Salvini, the head of the League, which is now in uh, government uh, in Italy, or indeed uh, the prime ministers of Poland uh, or Hungary. Um, uh, the other alternative is that uh, you know, the, the, the threat of Donald Trump uh, could lead to closer integration within the EU. That's the agenda of French President uh, Macron. Uh, it's an agenda that is shared uh, in a more lukewarm basis from German Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, and needs must. Uh, potentially, this could, this, this could lead to a big leap forward in European integration in terms of taking greater responsibility for its own defence and indeed, as we're already seeing, uh, pursuing a much more vigorous trade policy that goes around the United States uh, you know, by, by concluding all sorts of trade deals uh, with, with different countries. With Donald Trump, Philip, uh, saying things uh, 
like he said in North Dakota last week, uh, that the European Union was set up to take advantage of, of the United States. We can't let that happen, he said. Um, it, I mean, is that likely to drive uh, more European integration, to drive um, uh, European states closer together, that kind of language? Well, first of all, it's factually untrue. The, the predecessor of the EU, the whole European integration project was supported by uh, all previous US presidents uh, because they thought that it was a way of creating peace, stability and prosperity first in Western Europe and then in Europe as a whole. Remember that you know, this emerges as a peace project uh, after the devastation of the Second World War uh, and uh, during um, uh, the Cold War. So that, that's uh, factually incorrect. Now, he is going to do his best uh, to drive Europeans apart, uh, whether it's by playing um, a divided rule, um, by currying favour with um, uh, his allied populist authoritarian uh, far-right allies. Uh, uh, he's clearly uh, set out on a trade war uh, that's going to hit Europe uh, as well as China. He's undermining and potentially going to uh, even pull out of uh, NATO. Uh, and so, yes, it's, it's an existential challenge for, for Europe and for the global system. Uh, and uh, Europe has to rise to the occasion. Pauline, what's your, your take on this? America may be, uh, in the view of, uh, of Scott, and, and Philip was agreeing him, uh, with him, a, a rogue state, but Donald Trump is a democratically elected president. What's to be done about this? Well, basically, the... The potential good news is that in the American democracy, the president is elected for his four years, and um, maybe he won't be the president of the United States, you know, in the next election. The, the, the thing is that there is a perception right now that Trump is the United States. And of course he is because he's the president, but he is the United States for only the four years of his term. So there may be people in the EU, in, in Japan, in Canada who says, yes, we're going to react and we're going to deal with whatever he throws at us, but let's not go all the way. Let, let's take a look, you know, in another couple of years, what's going to happen. Are the Americans still going to be gung-ho after an American, America first, America alone president? Or are they going to say, gee, gee whiz, we got it all wrong? So I think that right now, while all different various governments, the, the Chinese, whether it's the, um, uh, the Canadians or the EU or Japan, they're likely to be very grown up about this and say, yes, we're going to react to specific things that the Trump administration is throwing at us, but let's not go sort of, let's not hyperventilate us yet. Scott, do you agree with that? Does it matter if the rest of the world takes a, a grown-up approach to what Donald Trump is doing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this we're talking about economics here, but it matters on the environment. It matters on social issues. It matters on basic rights. But I, let me take, pick up on what Philip said, because I agree and want to extend that, and that is from the challenge that we face, there are opportunities. And in the case of Europe, it is whether the EU, which is facing the dual uh, threat of Trump and of Brexit Britain, whether it really gets its act in order in terms of economic arrangements, social arrangements, even mutual defense. The Chinese right now will already be planning. They'll be facing Trump and they'll be planning for how do we deal with an international system where the Americans are in a sense off to the side and they'll be making arrangements in Asia, for example. Other countries will be looking to develop a trans-Pacific partnership or will be looking to develop international institutions while treating the Americans almost as a case which is in suspension. Uh, that's not optimal. It would be better if the Americans are inside the international system. But I think what you have is in the next 12 months, 24 months, before Trump goes, and this is where I would slightly differ with Pauline, these questions will be faced as core questions in which other countries no longer see it as a question of following the U.S. lead, but having to make their own arrangements and not be dependent on American involvement for those arrangements to work.
Philip, the, the, the surprising thing, uh, I think, has, has been not how easy it, it, it's been for Trump to attack these alliances and, and institutions that have been around since the, the end of the Second World War, but just how fragile they seem now that they, they're under attack. Do you agree with that? Well, sure. I mean, these institutions were underpinned um, by uh, U.S. power, you know, uh, underpinning um, the system of multilateral rules was the fact that the dominant power in the world, uh, in its enlightened self-interest, um, uh, was underpinning them. And obviously, if that dominant power uh, de decides otherwise, then everything starts uh, to fall apart. Now, what's quite striking is that, you know, the United States is a, is a declining uh, hegemon. It's threatened by uh, the rise of China uh, and indeed other uh, emerging powers. Uh, and normally what happens in situations like that is that the declining hegemon tries to pre preserve the international system it created in order to preserve its status uh, in, and uh, preserve uh, its power and prosperity. And instead of that, you see the rising power, which is China, saying actually we're keen on most of the system that exists. Uh, and uh, the uh, declining hegemon in the United States saying actually want to, to, to blow it up. Now, Trump says, well, that's because the old system was rigged against us uh, and uh, we're going to create a new one uh, by bilaterally acting tough and excluding better concessions uh, out of others. Uh, the reality is that actually uh, it's, he is blowing up American prosperity and blowing up uh, American power. And even if uh, Donald Trump is uh, ejected from office in 2020 by U.S. voters, uh, he'll have done so much damage that it will be very hard uh, for future uh, U.S. presidents in different circumstances uh, to, be re to rebuild what he's demolished. Pauline, very briefly, can, can these alliances and institutions survive long enough to outlive Trump's presidency? You sounded a note of optimism a few moments ago. Well, yes, in, in the sense that if the Trump presidency doesn't, if he doesn't go for another term, then yes, you know, OK, we'll write it off as, as four years of madness that somehow just descended on the United States. But a bigger problem here is that it's not just Trump. There seems to be a sea change in, in political reaction to globalization, to free trade that once was considered, you know, it's the most wonderful thing. No one ever questions it. But look at Brexit. Look at the fact that one in two voters voted for Trump. There is a reaction to globalization. Maybe blowing it up isn't the right way, but they want... There is a demand at grassroots. We want something more than just the globalization, the free trade that has been, you know, the yeah. status quo for the past okay. 10 years or whatever. Scott, they may not know what they want, but Scott, I think there is a uh, uh, change. Pick, picking up from what Pauline was saying, you know, what if, what if Trump does get elected? Of course, there are midterms in the US in November. Um, how's that? How are the midterms actually impacting up, upon Trump's behavior uh, right now? I mean, does it go to some way to, to, to explaining what he's doing right now? Has he got one, one eye on the midterms? Oh, it's absolutely essential, not just for Trump, but for the key campaign advisors against Stephen Miller. And that is because they see two issues as being key to running to hold the Congress in Republican hands in November. One is the idea of trades and tariffs, America showing its dominance over others, and two, on the home front, the get tough, zero tolerance policy on immigration that has split up families and put children in detention. Their gamble is, is that enough Americans like that macho, alpha male approach, no matter how much damage it causes, that the Republicans will actually hold on to Congress and Trump can look forward to a second term. If they're right, and if the Republicans do succeed in November, then we are in for turmoil for quite a while. If, however, they're wrong and the voters actually turn against the Republicans, then I think that will force a reassessment sooner rather than later. And we may get out of this not unscathed, but at least with less damage than what I'm fearing at this point. And there, I'm afraid we must leave it. Many thanks indeed. Scott Lucas, Professor of International Politics at the University of Birmingham. Philippe Legrain, former economic advisor to the President of the European Commission. And uh, Pauline Loon, Managing Director of Asia Analytica. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for watching. Don't forget, you can see the programme at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash AJ Story. 
And you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle, at AJ Inside Story, from me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.